My name is John. I work at Mapbox, and I spent the last year working on the ID editor for OpenStreetMap and on the design and functionality of OpenStreetMap.org, the project's main website. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a high level about the technical side of those efforts, enough to give you an idea of what the goals were. But most of this talk is about the human side, about community, community management and open source stewardship. And my hope for the talk is that sharing what worked for me and my collaborators will help three groups of people. The first group is open source contributors who, like me, want to help the project tackle big technical changes. And the second group is other outside organizations, public or private, who want to engage effectively with the OpenStreetMap Open community. And then finally, members of the community who want to see OpenStreetMap become a more friendly and welcoming community for everyone who would like to contribute. So I work at Mapbox. Mapbox paid me to work on ID and work on the website. And so first, I want to answer the question, why does Mapbox care about OpenStreetMap anyway? Why would they pay someone to work on it? And the answer is that the foundation of Mapbox Maps is OpenStreetMap data, the roads, the parks, uh, building footprints, points of interest. All of that comes straight from OpenStreetMap. So Mapbox wins, Mapbox wins only if OpenStreetMap community has the tools and the leadership and the community cohesion to build a geographic data set that rivals that of much bigger and better funded organizations. And it's important that the, these interests, the interests of Mapbox and of OpenStreetMap, align in a certain way. Uh, the community is bigger than any one group, any corporation or geographic region or language-based community. And it's very unlikely that any one of those groups can win by trying to dominate the community, by trying to make changes unilaterally, or by forking the data and hoping that people come over to their side. And several times in OSM's history, there's been particular groups or organizations that have tried to do that. And how many exactly depends on who you talk to, of course. Uh, but it has happened. Fortunately, none of those efforts have been successful. But they have left a mark. And I saw that when I first started getting involved with the project in 2012. I did my first OpenStreetMap conference in October in Portland. And this was shortly after Mapbox announced a grant from the Knight Foundation to work on OpenStreetMap core infrastructure. Uh, it was before I started working at Mapbox. Um, but I was really starting to get in, uh, interested in, in, in involved technically with the project. So I went to a session at the conference called Knight Foundation's Investment in Domain Street Map. And what I remember about that session is that uh, the mood in the room was, was kind of tense, almost hostile. And there were a lot of long-term community members who were very concerned about what Mapbox was going to do and how this influx of money was going to affect the project. Now, fortunately, uh, it was a very productive and civil discussion. And what came out of it and a lot of subsequent discussions was that we, engineers and designers at Mapbox, and other interested collaborators should focus on two things. Uh, the first was building a new modern editor uh, built on web standards targeting, first and foremost, the needs of new and casual contributors to OSM. And the editor we built is called ID. It's built entirely in JavaScript and HTML and CSS, and it's embedded directly in the OpenStreetMap website. 
And the second thing that we decided would be best to work on was improvements to the website itself. Uh, focusing on improving the experience for first time visitors and people who are new to OSM, consolidating some duplication of functionality, and giving the site a more modern look and feel. And the website had, had developed, as many open source projects do, uh, by slowly accreting features. Uh, there were very few times in history where it had had focused attention on design or information architecture. So this is what it looked like um, before we started any of our work on it. And this is what it looks like today. So in, in terms of the timeline, thank you. In terms of the timeline, we obviously didn't do all of this at once. Uh, in May, we launched uh, version 1.0 of ID, and it was made available as a uh, editor choice on OSM, but, but not the default editor. In July, we kicked off our iterations on website design with a consolidation of the map controls for navigation and sharing and layers, uh, putting those all in the top right corner. And then in August, we moved on to a welcome page for new users, uh, explaining the most um, important points about the project and uh, defining some terms uh, to better better guide them into their first contributions. Uh, that shipped in August, and uh, next up was a redesign of the map sharing and permalink controls, the share UI. And also in August, we made some changes and uh, additions to ID that had been brought up by the community as being necessary to make ID the default editor, which it did in August. So what about September through November? Uh, well, September, uh, I went to the State of the Map International Conference in the UK, which was really fun. And I talked about our plans for uh, some larger scale redesigns to the website. And then I took a vacation and uh, cycled around the UK for a couple weeks, which was awesome. And I came back uh, invigorated to work harder on this redesign. And so in October and November, this is what happened. This is the GitHub pull request in which we redesigned the map pages on openstreetmap.org. That's the front page, the history page, export page, and all of the pages that display individual features, uh, nodes, weights, and relations. So this pull request has uh, 256 plus commits, 33 participants, 121 comments, and dozens of screenshots. I opened it on October 1st, and it was merged on November 28th, at which point the redesign was live. So this is what collaboration in modern open source communities looks like. So after the dust settled on that, I got an email from Andy Allen, who is uh, one of my favorite OSM contributors. And he said, if you have any suggestions or experiences about the whole process to share, I'd love to hear them. Making large or even medium-sized changes to OSM becomes an almost Herculean task. And so anything we can collectively learn to make this process easier in the future is important. So when I reflected on how to answer this, the first thing that I realized was that from the community's perspective, the redesign was in many ways a larger and more significant change than ID had been. Even though ID was, uh, in terms of number of lines of code and complexity, uh, a much larger project technically. Uh, so the answer to Andy's question began to take shape from that. Why was it the case that the redesign was such a challenge? What made changing the design harder than changing the editor? 
and how are we able to uh, successfully accomplish both of those. So ID had the significant advantage, significant advantage of being compartment, compartmentalizable. Uh, we could work on it largely using our own processes and then slot it into osm.org when done. Um, of course, uh, like much of our work, uh, and by the way, when I say are we in this presentation, I'm talking about myself and uh, other designers and developers at Mapbox and all of the contributions we got from other members of the OpenStreetMap community. So like much of our work, ID was developed in the open from the get-go, uh, but because it was brand new, it enjoyed relative anonymity early in its life. And I say enjoyed anonymity because software that doesn't have users is the easiest software to change. It's more malleable than it will be at any other point in its life cycle, especially after it becomes successful and enjoys the benefits, but also the costs of an active user base. Uh, OpenStreetMap.org has millions of users. It's hard to change. And one of the reasons of, for this is that humans, especially groups of humans, uh, tend to be inherently conservative in a certain way. Uh, we're loss averse. We strongly prefer to avoid loss than to acquire gains. And uh, this is a really interesting phenomenon that's been studied by psychologists and economists and decision theorists. Um, there was one experiment that looked at this that involved two groups of people. And the first group was given a mug. And each person was given a mug and told, this is your mug. It's, you own it now. It's yours to keep. And the second group of people were shown the same mug, invited to look at it, but uh, did not own it. And then they asked members of both groups, well, how much would you be willing to sell your mug for? or how much would you be willing to buy a mug for if you don't own it? And the mug owners named an average selling price of $5.78. The mug buyers were willing to pay $2.21. So the people who had something wanted much more to part with it than the potential acquirers wanted to pay for it. We, we prefer to have we prefer, to, we prefer to keep what we currently have rather than risk what often seems like an uncertain trade-off. And another way to look at this is that there's a status quo bias, a status quo bias, a preference for things as they are. Now, economists and decision theorists view loss aversion and status quo bias as irrational, but I think when it comes to software, they might actually be rational learned responses because everyone can think of a piece of software that went bad, like it accumulated feature bloat to the point where it collapsed under its own weight or it underwent a redesign that aligned it with corporate interests but against the interests of its users. So with those examples in mind, I try to respond to resistance to change in OSM with empathy. Um, we're really lucky to have uh, passionate community members who recognize the reasons that OSM has been successful, and they want to make sure that those reasons are not easily abandoned. Uh, that's not to say that they're always right or that they always have good ideas for the direction that the project is going. Uh, that's far from true. But their resistance is often rooted in legitimate concerns, which I think we can listen for. And uh, I think the concept of empathy and, and listening is uh, so undervalued in many technical uh, communities and OpenStreetMap in, in, in particular that I want to uh, take a minute here and um, call out this talk, Building Compassionate Communities in Tech by Isaac Schluter, uh, was given at NodeConf EU last year. Uh, there's a point in this talk where he stops and, and says, if you get nothing else out of this talk, then go buy this book because it'll change your life. Uh, 
I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to claim that his presentation will change your life. But uh, if you get nothing else out of mine, please go watch this one. It's absolutely fantastic. So anyway, back to the question: What things did we do that made us successful in accomplishing change? Uh, so here are some of the most important things: Work in the open. Uh, this is so ingrained in the way that Mapbox operates that I almost didn't think to put it in these slides, but it is incredibly important. It's kind of like the price of admission for working with, uh, for working effectively in open source and with open data communities. Um, if you want the trust and the expertise of these communities, then be transparent about your goals and motivations and show your work. Do that work incrementally in small pieces. And this goes back to loss aversion. Uh, when changes come in small pieces, it's easier for people to see that their potential losses are also small or that there is no loss. And often the gains are clearer too, but even when they aren't, like when a lot of incremental changes build on each other and don't really pay off until the end, um, it's still easier to build trust with a series of small changes than with one larger change. Um, our redesign pull request, uh, that 250 commit monstrosity, would never have stood a chance if we hadn't built up trust from a bunch of smaller changes preceding it. Over-communicate. Uh, clearly explain the objectives and benefits of the change you're proposing and do so in multiple venues and at multiple times. So for the OSM work that we did, uh, we blogged about it on the Mapbox blog, on a separate OSM dev blog. We did four conference talks at multiple venues. We had birds of a feather sessions at those conferences. We had uh, multiple, many, many in-person conversations, uh, private email threads, public mailing list threads, GitHub pull requests, OSM diary entries, and we made ourselves available on IRC. Over communicating over-communicating is not the same thing as being verbose. Uh, simple explanations are usually better, in fact. The point is that while you have been involved with the change since its inception, everyone else is hearing about it at a different time and place. And most of those people just need a little bit of reassurance that the motivations uh, that you are responding to are also meaningful to them. And over-communication also had, uh, helps head off a phenomenon uh, that was summed up very well by Paul Ford in an essay he wrote called, Why Wasn't I Consulted? And he wrote, brace yourself for the initial angry wave of criticism. How dare you, I hate it. It's ugly, you're stupid. The internet runs on knee-jerk reactions. People will test your work against their pet theories. It is not free and thus has no value. It lacks community features. I can't believe you don't use dot caps, lamp sheets, or pixel scrims. It is not written in Rust or Erskel. My cat is displeased. The ultimate question beneath these curses, why wasn't I consulted? So communicating early enough and lets people feel like they're being consulted. Uh, some of them will give you great feedback, some of them won't, but many of them who might have been part of that angry mob if they hadn't felt consulted will go on to think, okay, I'm, I'm okay with this. Be polite, always be polite. Uh, thank people for their feedback, give it genuine consideration. If you disagree, politely explain your reasons, and if you need to ignore a conversation that's turned too acrimonious or heated, uh, do so until you can give a, a patient and courteous reply. You don't have to feel obligated to respond to obvious trolls or people that are consistently negative. Um, I've noticed that those people tend to marginalize themselves without your help. <laughs> So 
set bounds, uh, actively define what you're not trying to accomplish with a particular change, and what you consider to be off topic for a given conversation. Something like 50% of the feedback that I get um, in pull requests and other venues tends to be suggestions that fall outside of those bounds that I've set. And that's fine. I just respond with various uh, variants of, sounds like a good idea, but it's more than we're trying to accomplish with this particular change. And, and oftentimes those are, are good opportunities to over communicate with that person about what the goals are because perhaps they don't really know. Call for cloture. Uh, debates in OSM will go on forever if you let them, so don't. Uh, OSM is a duocracy and that applies just as much to finishing change as it does to starting it. So at a certain point you can thank everyone for their feedback and reiterate what your goals are and the benefits that the change introduces and then remind folks that perfect is the enemy of much better than what we have now and uh, try to push that change through. And finally, be patient. Um, change in OSM always takes longer than I expect, but it does happen. Thank you.